Preparing for what comes next is a big part of becoming an adult. So, if your teenager says they want to join the military, they're preparing for a real challenge. Visit todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 85, for broadcast on the 26th of October, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, a new study suggests plate tectonics may have been active on Earth since the very beginning, a scientific explanation for the strange sound sometimes heard during auroral displays, and hot on the heels of problems with Hubble, now NASA's Chandra X-ray Space Telescope has also gone into safe mode. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study suggests that plate tectonics may have been active across the Earth's surface from the planet's very birth 4.6 billion years ago. The Earth's crust is divided into large tectonic plates. These float on top of the hot, viscous mantle, slowly moving across the surface as convective currents bring hot material up from deep inside the planet and cooler material sinks back down into the Earth. The idea that plate tectonics has been here since the planet's beginning contradicts other hypotheses suggesting that plate tectonics developed over the course of billions of years. The new findings reported in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters could help predict whether planets beyond our solar system could be habitable for life. One of the study's authors, Assistant Professor Nick Digert from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, says plate tectonics help set up the conditions for life. He says the more scientists know about ancient plate tectonics on Earth, the better they can understand how the Earth got to be the way it is now. Digert and colleagues looked at the distribution of two very specific noble gas isotopes, helium-3 and neon-22. Noble gases are those which don't react with other chemical elements. Previous models have explained Earth's current helium-3 neon-22 ratio by arguing that a series of large-scale impacts resulted in prolonged massive magma oceans, which degassed and incrementally increased this ratio. However, Digert believes the scenario is unlikely, he says while there's no conclusive evidence that this didn't happen, it could have only raised Earth's helium-3 neon-22 ratio under very specific conditions. Instead, Digert and colleagues believe the helium-3 neon-22 ratio raised in a very different way. They found that as Earth's crust is continuously formed, the ratio of helium to neon in the mantle beneath the crust increases. By calculating this ratio in the mantle beneath the crust and considering how this process would have affected the bulk Earth over long periods of time, a rough timeline of Earth's tectonic plate cycling can be established. Digert says helium-3 and neon-22 were produced during the formation of the solar system and not by other means, and so provide valuable insights into Earth's earliest conditions and subsequent geologic activity. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. For years, local residents near and above the Arctic Circle have reported loud cracking sounds, which occasionally accompany the aurora borealis or northern lights. Scientists have long been sceptical about the claims, but then in 2012, researchers at Alta University confirmed the popping and cracking sounds, saying they're associated with an inversion layer just 70 metres above the ground. Scientists used arrays of microphones to pick up and isolate the sounds, confirming their existence. The sounds appear to be generated when the geomagnetic storm causing the auroral lights causes charges accumulating in the atmosphere's inversion layer to discharge. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. To something unusual and yet fascinating, and that is um, auroras. We have auroras in the northern and southern hemisphere at various times, but um, uh, certainly much more spectacular up north because let me qualify, more people see them up north than down south because of the uh, the way the, the population spread around the world. But uh, they are fascinating. They are truly fascinating. And you've, you've um, actually gone on expeditions to look at these things in the past. That's correct. Yes, I've taken 
I think, five expeditions up to far northern Scandinavia and occasionally to Iceland as well. We've been to Iceland. And so, yeah, the, the, being underneath an auroral display is just staggering. It's the whole sky is lit up with these green and sometimes magenta colours, uh, really. And, and occasionally beige. Occasionally beige, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, you do. You get a mixture of colours, and we now understand pretty well what causes this. This is these are subatomic particles from the sun, electrons and protons being funneled by the Earth's magnetic field to interact with the atoms of Earth's atmosphere, and that's what causes the colours. It's the the Earth's atmosphere being excited to display these colours. The path of the electrons is a curious one though, because they go past the Earth and then fall back and come back in from the other side, the side away from the sun. It's a very complicated process. Process, hmm. but well studied, and there are particularly in northern Scandinavia, there are several institutions which exist to basically map out the upper atmosphere and work out what's happening there. Many of which I've visited. But one of the other things about the aurora, the northern lights, and we are talking now about the northern lights, although the southern lights are symmetrical, so it would it would be the same. But as you say, there's nobody there to see them. That's right. And one of the things that has impressed me, I've talked to physicists and lots of people who work on this up in northern Scandinavia, but also when you talk talk to, um, you know, the locals and particularly the Sami people, the, the indigenous people of that area, the Laplanders, basically. There's a common theme that says you can hear the aurora. They do make sounds. Now, that, that comes as quite a surprise to me because I, I thought that uh, you would stand under these things and you would see them, but it would be in Total silence. silence. Has, yeah. been that, has that been your experience? It has indeed. That's been my experience. No sounds at all. And um, scientists for a long time have been very, very sceptical about this. You know, oh, you, you don't hear things. It must have been the snow crackling or something like that. Mm. But now we've got really hard scientific evidence that there are noises. And it's actually some work that's been done in uh, Aalto University, which is in Finland. And there's a team there that are using... Uh, whole sets of microphones to record any sounds that might turn up during an auroral display. And sure enough, they get them, they pick them up. And it's slightly more, it's more technical than that, because since they're using many microphones set out in array, they can triangulate. So when they hear noises, they can work out exactly where these noises are coming from. And it seems to be that they typically come from what's called an inversion layer. This is a layer of the atmosphere where the temperature changes rapidly. It's probably colder near the ground and then slightly warmer above. At about 70 metres above the ground, that is where these auroral sounds seem to come from. And they're speculating that the inversion layer causes the, the charged particles in the air to be separated and then come back together again with a little clap because the pressure is changing. I'm totally surprised that an aurora, which is, you know, way up there... 90 kilometres is the low. ...would have an effect on something 70 metres above, above the ground. ground. Yeah. So it's all about, I guess it's more to do with the particles that make it to the ground or make it much nearer the ground that you don't see. They've lost the energy that you require to excite the atmosphere. Mm. But it clearly is linking the sounds to the brightest aurorae. Apparently the, the sounds come when the aurorae are brightest. They've done a, what you call a spectral analysis. They've worked out what frequencies these sounds are and they're right in the middle of the audio spectrum so people can hear them. They, so if you're in the right place at the right time under the right conditions, you will hear an aurora. That is right, probably. <laughs> okay. So, and, um, and the is, sound is more like like a snap. You said. Well, yes. Apparently, there's a range of sounds, but one of the ones that we've got recorded that you might be able to play, Andrew, I'm is, going a, to is try. it sounds just like a pair of clapping sticks coming together. You know, the, the wooden clapping sticks. So, this is what they sound like. If we can get this right. Yeah. It just sounds like someone warming up in a recording studio. <laughs> Hang on, let's try that again. Yeah. That's what it that's sounds right. like. So it is. There's a definite click there. So the scientist who's doing this work, whose name is Unto Lane, says people who talk and walk around concentrating on picture taking might never hear a single sound related to an aurora. You've got to stop all of their activities and focus on listening. We Finns are probably good at this because we've received more than 300 reports of sound observations during their uh, auroral acoustics project. And he says he's learned that a geomagnetic storm by itself isn't enough to produce them. You also require a strong inversion 
conversion layer, which acts like an electrostatic loudspeaker. Without it, there are no sounds. And that explains why a lot of these geomagnetic storms are silent. He says it's like geomagnetic thunder, which is a very nice way of putting it. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Well, hot on the hills of problems with NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, it now seems NASA's Earth-orbiting Challenger X-ray Space Telescope has also experienced a few problems of its own. It's back in normal operation now, but earlier had suddenly switched itself into safe mode. The move to safe mode was caused by a glitch in one of Challenger's gyroscopes, the same problem which affected Hubble. The Chandra glitch resulted in a three-second period of bad data, and that in turn led onboard computers to calculate an incorrect value for the spacecraft's momentum. The erroneous momentum indication then triggered the safe mode. Mission managers then switched gyroscopes, placing the gyro which caused the glitch in a reserve. Once reconfigured with a series of pre-tested flight software patches, the team were able to return Chandra to science operations. Safe mode places the spacecraft's delicate instruments into a safe configuration, and critical hardware is switched to backup systems. The move also configures the satellite's solar panels to get the maximum amount of sunlight and ensures its mirrors are always pointed away from the sun. The transition to safe mode was nominal, that is, all consistent with normal parameters, and all systems functioning as expected and scientific instruments safe. Chandra has now been orbiting the Earth for 19 years. That's almost four times longer than its original five-year design life. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. The Russian Federal Space Agency Roscosmos says it plans to restart Soyuz launches shortly following its investigation into what's been the most dangerous manned spaceflight incident since the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster in 2003. All Soyuz flights were grounded after this month's dramatic ascent abort just two minutes after the launch of the Soyuz MS-10 from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The mission was carrying two new crew members to the International Space Station. The emergency happened as the four strap-on liquid-fueled boosters were being jettisoned one minute and 58 seconds after launch. As the boosters were flipping clear of the rocket in a spectacular manoeuvre known as the Korolev Cross, one of the boosters failed to separate cleanly, fatally damaging the Soyuz FG launch vehicle's core stage. The Soyuz capsule quickly jettisoned, landing in a high-G ballistic descent, hitting the ground at least five times before coming to rest on its side, 400 kilometres downrange of the launch pad. State Commission investigators have traced the issue to a problem during the launch vehicle's assembly at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, identifying those responsible and their supervisors. Soyuz launches could now resume as soon as this week, with a Soyuz 2 slated to fly carrying a military payload from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome north of Moscow. And Roscosmos says a new crew will be flying to the International Space Station in December aboard the Soyuz MS-11 capsule. Quality control is developed as a major issue for Russian spacecraft manufacturers, with numerous production issues affecting both Soyuz and Proton rocket launches in recent years. Just last month, the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft, which is currently docked to the space station, suddenly started venting atmosphere into space when a hole opened out in the Soyuz capsule's orbital module. A separate Roscosmos investigation into how the hole was made and quickly patched up is still underway. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The Soyuz MS-08 capsule carrying three Expedition 56 crew members has landed safely on the Kazakhstan steppe following 197 days in orbit aboard the International Space Station. Attitude nominal. And getting confirmation, the deorbit burn has begun. Again, this is planned to last four minutes and 39 seconds in duration. Four minutes, 30 seconds, uh, 125 delta V. Main engine cutoff command executed. Uh, KSWO. Open. Confirmed. Confirmation the deorbit burn has ended. The engine has been cut out. 
standing by for separation. And getting a report from the visiting vehicle officer, the modules have separated uh, based off the telemetry that they're seeing. So again, the orbital and service module separating from that descent module uh, for them to ultimately burn up and allow the descent module to do its controlled reentry through the Earth's atmosphere, followed shortly thereafter by the deployment of uh, the parachutes. First, the drogue chute, uh, which will do its initial slowing of the vehicle. And once they get a little bit lower, the main parachute will deploy, ultimately slowing the vehicle down to uh, just about uh, 7.2 meters per second and allowing some heat to dissipate from the heat shield. And then the soft landing engines firing just a little under a meter off the ground. And then the vehicle touching down. And the Soyuz spacecraft under parachutes already. Large off-gassing is actually uh, spare fuel for the reaction control thrusters being vented prior to landing. Ground teams there at the landing zone. In that spacecraft, three crew members, Drew Foisel, Ricky Arnold, and Oleg Artemiev, slowly descending to the ground there in Kazakhstan. Under the parachutes, everything going nominally or normally uh, throughout all of the Soyuz descent activities today. It looks like uh, the last of the hydrogen peroxide being vented out that used to power those reaction control thrusters. It's going to continue to descend under this parachute all the way down. Uh, eventually slowing to about 7.2 meters per second. Once it's just about a meter above the ground, some soft landing engines will fire six engines uh, to slow the Soyuz's descent rate to a final one and a half meters per second. Those will fire just off the ground uh, about two seconds prior to landing. Again, landing yeah. was targeted for 6.45 a.m. Central Time. The heat shield being expelled from the vehicle as planned. And we are just about one minute away from planned landing. Helicopter passed by just in the background. They're circling around, waiting for the capsule to touch down there in Kazakhstan. We should be seeing a landing any moment now. And touchdown. Landing coming at 6.44 a.m. Central Time, 7.44 a.m. Eastern Time. Ricky Arnold, Drew Foisel, and Oleg Artemiev back on planet Earth. So one by one, the crew members will be extracted here momentarily. We expect uh, the uh, Soyuz commander, Oleg Artemiev, in the center seat of this descent module, uh, to be brought out first, followed by uh, Drew Foistel and Ricky Arnold, who are flanking him as they were for launch 197 days ago. They will be uh, brought into the medical tent for early uh, medical evaluations before they are placed in individual helicopters to be flown two hours uh, to the northeast of here, to the town of Karaganda, where we began uh, to stage the landing operations very early this morning. Artemiev is now out. He's being helped uh, by uh, search and recovery personnel, and uh, then we'll get uh, the two American uh, astronauts through Foistel, the Expedition 56 commander, and uh, Ricky Arnold, his flight engineer, out of the Soyuz, Ricky Arnold completing a year of education on station with just a spectacular, breathtaking touchdown. The uh, second of the crew members now being extracted, Drew Foistel, out of the Soyuz MS-08, being brought uh, to his uh, chair. And Ricky Arnold uh, will follow in short order here. Drew out. Drew again, the commander of Expedition 56, just wrapping up his third flight. Veteran previously of two space shuttle missions. And again, uh, two of the crew members out. Looks like Oleg's been handed uh, quite a bit of fruit, actually. I think I see a cantaloupe and a few other items. He actually piloted the fly around of the International Space Station manually. Uh, executing a, a pretty stunning maneuver, and enabling Drew Foistel, uh, the outgoing Expedition 56 commander, to gather some photos for the upcoming 20th anniversary, which I know uh, everybody very excited to mark that occasion coming up in November. And Ricky just now coming into view, getting lowered down in the chair, the third and final crew member out of that Soyuz spacecraft. A big smile already coming from Ricky, again, who just wrapped up his second space flight, having previously flown on shuttle mission STS-1. 19. While on station, the Expedition 56 crew completed hundreds of experiments, including studies into ultra-cold quantum gases and a system that uses surface forces to separate liquids in microgravity. The crew also received and unloaded several cargo ships filled with several tons of equipment and supplies. These included the 9th Cygnus resupply ship in May, the 15th Dragon capsule in July, the Progress MS-09 cargo ship on a record-setting four-hour rapid rendezvous flight path in August, and the 7th JAXA HTV cargo ship a week ago. 
There are also three extravehicular activities, or EVAs, NASA speak for spacewalks. They were used to carry out regular maintenance and equipment upgrades, including replacing both old cameras and installing new additional cameras, changing out a cooling system, replacing communications equipment, including the installation of new antennas, attaching the Icarus Earth Observation Science Package to one of the Russian modules, and the deployment by hand of four small satellites. As tensions continue to rise in the South China Sea, Beijing has launched two new advanced Yogan 32 military spy satellites. The spacecraft were launched aboard a Long March 2C rocket from the Zhukuang Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. The mission also marked the first flight of the Yuanjing 1S upper stage, designed to dramatically enhance the launch vehicle's payload lift capacity from 1.2 to almost 2 tons. Referred to euphemistically by Beijing as scientific remote sensing satellites, the official Chinese Xinhuan News Agency claims the spacecraft will be used for electromagnetic environmental surveys and other related technology tests. In reality, the Yaogang-32 reconnaissance satellites are part of China's rapidly expanding military prowess, designed to keep an eye on rivals and protect the communist nation's growing global interests including its new naval bases in the South China Sea, where US and Allied forces are enforcing freedom of navigation rights, which recently saw a near collision between American and Chinese warships. Three days after the launch of the Chinese spy satellites, Beijing followed up with the launch of two more Badu or Compass navigation satellites. The Badu 3 Mio 15 and 3 Mio 16 were launched in the Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province in southwestern China. The Badu 3 system satellites are the 39th and 40th in the Badu Navigation System satellite constellation. Beijing plans at least 11 more Badu 3 satellite launches by 2020, giving it global coverage and matching the American GPS, European Galileo and Russian GLONASS satellite navigation systems. This flight also included equipment to record data and engineering measurements to prepare for future parachute landings of boosters. The launch was the 28th by China so far this year and the 287th mission for the Long March rocket series. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A population-based study of nearly 69,000 French adults has found a significant reduction in the risk of cancer among people who ate lots of organic foods. If the findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association can be confirmed with further research, promoting organic food consumption in the general population could be a promising preventative strategy against some cancers. However, while the findings warranted further research, scientists warned they should be taken with a grain of salt, as the intake levels were all self-reported and were not scientifically validated. A new study warns that important heritage sites in the Mediterranean, including Venice, Pisa's Piazza del Domino and the medieval city of Rhodes, are all being threatened by coastal erosion and flooding due to rising sea levels. Of 49 coastal Mediterranean UNESCO World Heritage Sites, researchers found 37 were at risk from a 100-year flood event and 42 from coastal erosion by the turn of the century. The findings are reported in the journal Nature Communications. The world's first quad-rear camera smartphone has been unveiled. The announcement of the Galaxy A9 comes just a month or so after Samsung released its Galaxy A7, a mid-tier handset with three rear cameras. Each of the four cameras on the new cell phone serves a specific function, with the top offering 8 megapixels and an ultra-wide 120-degree lens. The next features a telephoto lens with 10 megapixels and 2 times optical zoom. The third acts as the primary camera, offering 24 megapixels, and the fourth is 5 megapixels with a depth sensor. The A9 is equipped with a Snapdragon 660 processor with 128 gigabytes of internal memory, either 6 or 8 gigabytes of RAM, and of course room for a micro SD card with up to 512 gigabytes. There's yet another reason to start the day with a coffee. A new report in the Journal of the American Medical Association claims coffee may be good for your skin. It seems the caffeine in coffee has been linked to a reduced risk of rosacea, a common skin condition in which people develop rosy cheeks and a permanent flushed look. The study, involving more than 80,000 women, found those who drank at least four cups of coffee per day were less likely to develop the condition compared to those who didn't drink coffee. 
Interestingly, the same link was not found for caffeine intake from other sources, such as tea or chocolate. The scientific method involves observation, hypothesis, experimentation, analysis and conclusion. Science is all about critical thinking. It's a search for the truth. Don't just take someone's word for it. Test the claim. See if it's factual and stands up, or if it's just a great steaming pile of woo. That's what skepticism and evidence-based science is all about. It's a search for the truth. And remember, scientific facts don't care if you like them or not. A new Cochrane review into research into the health effects of omega-3 fatty acids has found no evidence that it helps with heart conditions. But the review has been attacked by supplements manufacturers, as well as at least one board member of the National Heart Foundation. Now, while the supplements industry's cries are expected because, well, after all, it affects their profits, comments by a member of the National Heart Foundation are a little bit more serious. Or are they? Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics, takes a look at the real story. Omega-3 fatty acids have been considered for a very long time to have positive health effects of various kinds on um, uh, heart health, on uh, vascular health in general, Joints. on the brain. On the brain, on joints, there's, there's all kinds of claims. This specific review that we're talking about is a Cochrane review, and I'll describe what that means in a moment, but it looked at a contribution of omega-3 fatty acids to heart health. Now, the Cochrane Collaboration is a, an organization that does systematic reviews. Volunteers for the Cochrane Collaboration look at all of the studies in specific areas, and they do it in a way that is meaningful from a statistical and clinical perspective. And they try to basically put together a statement about the state of the science about specific questions. And they're generally considered to be very trustworthy, first of all, because the people who participate in those Cochrane reviews are highly qualified, but also because there's no agenda here except to find out what's the best of science. So the Cochrane review discovered that despite the claims for the effectiveness of omega-3 to heart health, the evidence when 79 trials uh, involving a total of more than 112,000 people were put together and uh, the analysis was done appropriately. Basically, the evidence did not suggest that there is actually a benefit to heart health. So there are plenty of organizations, of course, that manufacture food additives of various kinds and supplements. And these organizations obviously would uh, not be particularly happy with the idea that, that something like omega-3 acids, which are lucrative for them, do not actually uh, do what they claim that they can do. So somebody uh, from uh, one of these organizations put out a, an article that described their failings of the Cochrane Review, including claims about the lack of attention to the low dose of typical omega-3 pills, one gram per day, and all kinds of other complaints about the study. However, the Cochrane Review actually did look at those things. They did look at higher doses. They specifically looked at how the dose relates to any effect, and they could not find any. And dose response is a major thing that all clinical studies should always look at because anything that actually helps should have different effects at different doses. And if you don't see uh, any difference between different doses, then that's generally an indication that the medication or the supplement does not do what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, the lead author of the review rebuffed the claims by this uh, professor and showed step by step how all of the claims against the Cochrane review were simply not correct and suggested probably a little bit condescendingly that maybe the article has not been read prior to the uh, rebuttal being written. That's Aran Segev, president of Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast -coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. Music
You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.